Praise God. I don't know if anything needs to be added to this or not, but it's hard to, hard to have a service like this and not uh, consider again the scripture that has been alluded to by a couple, and that's in Romans 8 that we know so well. I'm so thankful that we have a God who is unconditionally our friend and who loves us unconditionally because we are up and down and all around and the fact is those things are necessary in our lives if God is to do what he seeks to do in us. We're not what we ought to be when we come and his purpose is to change us, isn't it? And that's what, uh, that's the setting for this. Paul has been enumerating all the things that God has done for us, all he's given us, all his promises, the hope that he's laid before us. That's an eternal thing that winds up in glory, winds up, we wind up as his sons, heirs, joint heirs with Christ. I mean, it goes on and on with this glorious language of what God has done for us and promised us. And uh, of course, then he sets up the last of that chapter in verse 28 that we know so well. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And that's where I think we mess up sometimes, oftentimes, is, is in our expectations. We have our own picture of how things ought to go, how we ought to be, how fast things should, should happen. A gazillion things that, that are basically our ideas of how things ought to be. And instead of just letting go and saying, Lord, my life is in your hands. This is not my purpose. It doesn't even have to do fundamentally with earthly things, although you, you deal with, you use earthly things to work an eternal purpose, but it's not about here. It's about there. It's about what you have set yourself to do in me. And so all of this that we experience, the ups and downs of life, have to do with the fulfilling of whose purpose? His and we know, of course, that, uh, from verse 29, that has to do with making us like his son. And so the obvious question uh, is asked by Paul in verse 31, what then shall we say in response to this? How are we going to respond to the truth that God has laid out before us and all the wonderful things he's declared that he's going to do? Uh, how are we going to respond to this? And I think obviously God desires that we respond positively with faith, with understanding, so that we don't get tripped up as often as we do. And I certainly would raise my hand double that I, I get tripped up just as much as anybody here. We are all in this same warfare. The devil says the same stupid things to us all the time. We listen far too often than we should. And God is seek, simply seeking to turn our eyes right back to the fact that we are in his hands, he's on the job. He hasn't changed. We're the ones that are all over the map. You know, I was writing yesterday to a, uh, a letter to a prisoner. We seem to have a lot of prisoners that communicate with us, and they're not just the ones in Arizona. This was, this was actually in Kansas City, as a matter of fact. And uh, he was just expressing uh, a number of questions. Uh, he's, he's in a bad place. He's, he's done something that he's very, very deeply ashamed of and conscious of, and and his first question was, does God really love me and really accept me? Has he, will he really forgive me? He just saw himself as so low down and so beyond the reach of even the love of God that he, the devil was just beating on him, the, all these questions. My God, that's who God came to save, was sinners. It's the righteous folks he can't do anything for. So anyway, it was just a joy to encourage him, to point him back to the, the certainty of God's promise. You know, if, uh, if, if we can, uh, th it's really not a question of, is my sin too great? Is, is, is God truthful? That's the, that's the question that faces every one of us. It's not, what are our circumstances or am I too bad? Is, is God truthful when he has promised that he's able to save me completely through Jesus Christ? And so I refuse to say, God, you're a liar. It's not about me. It's about your power to save me. It's certainly not about my power to be anything. Yeah. What, I'm, you know, what God wants me to become is not achieved by me trying harder. It's achieved by me yielding and believing and trusting in the promise of God in the face of everything. And so what Paul is dealing with here is the various things that might seem to stand in the way of the fulfillment of God's promise. 
I mean, think about all the things that could possibly intervene and say, oh, whoops, that's not going to work out like we thought it was. And, and he begins by saying, you know, what, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Is there anyone who can actually stand in the way? I mean, is there anybody who can step in, including our own failure? Is there anybody that can stop the purpose of God? Have you put your hope in the purpose of God? Then, folks, we have something to shout about. We have something to rejoice in that is not just based upon, it it reaches beyond how we feel, beyond beyond how things are going in our lives at any given moment. There's not a one of us that are not called at times to walk through dry places. And, you know, we just have an awful time with this. We measure everything by how we feel and how things go. And that just isn't according to the word and the purpose of God. God is seeking to bring us to a place where we are willing to make a choice to say, God, I believe you in the face of everything. I believe you not because of anything I see or feel, but I'm like Abraham. I hope against hope. No matter how it looks, God, this is not based upon any of this. There's nothing about me that's gotten you by surprise, taken you by surprise that's more than you can handle. You are able, just as surely as you were able to give Abraham and Sarah a son when you promised. And Abraham believed you and God, you counted it for righteousness to him. Praise God. Praise God. We got everything in the world to shout about. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Now, this is, a, this is what, you know, th- it's been mentioned about God being our friend and, and the love as being the, the overriding thing that, that, just, that holds us, that keeps us. But love is not just simply a warm, gooey feeling. It's something that's demonstrated according to the, to the need of the one that's been loved. You and I need everything. We needed Jesus to go to that cross in our place or else we were going to have to go and we're going to have to suffer the, the judgment that was rightly due to us. But thank God there was one who stepped into my place and went there as my representative, as my substitute. He took all of this stuff that we see in ourselves that's so terrible and so shameful at times. That seems to stand in the way of the purpose of God. He took that upon himself. It's already done. It's already in the grave. Praise God. I don't have to be afraid of it. Don't have to wallow in it or live in it. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? I mean, just appealing to our simple logic. If God went to that extent, is he going to say, oh, well, that's a no. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to go the whole, I mean, I I know I gave him. I know that was a lot, but I'm just going to stop short. 